gotta run. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Dennis Mihailov. I heard about Dennis through an angel, an angel of light, Diana Kopruth. Dennis ran a fun 100 miler earlier this year for the first time. Later, he entered the Vermont 100 and finished that under 20 hours. And then eight weeks later, he won a 100 miler called the Virgil Crest, a race that over 50% don't finish. So obviously you don't say no to an angel. So I invited Dennis and here he is tonight. Thank you, Will. Pleasure to be here. Great. Dennis, let's get started by introducing yourself to our audience. Where were you born? A little bit about your family and something about your schooling. Sure. I was born and raised in Russia and I actually only came over to the United States six years ago. I went to law school in Russia and then I also have the degree in economics and after my brief uh, legal career in Russia I realized that's probably not the right place and time to be a lawyer. Uh, in this country and I uh, decided to move on and came over here to Rhode Island, Providence, uh, finished the business school and got my MBA degree and then moved to um, New York and now working in Midtown in finance. Excellent. Your childhood in Russia, were you very active athletically? As any boy in Russia, I played a lot of soccer. That's just given. If you're the boy in Russia, you got to play soccer and I actually loved it. I didn't do it competitively, I didn't uh, have any training schedule, I didn't exercise every day now. I just played in the neighborhood. You now moved into New York. What stage of life was running became a factor for you? That was actually very interesting. I started to work in the office in Manhattan and it was a bit of a life change for me, a lifestyle change because I never, I've never done it before, being eight to ten hours a day in a in the office, in the chair, in front of the computer. That's something that's, that was new to me. And in a couple of years, I started to notice that maybe it's the age, maybe it's this new lifestyle. I started to notice kind of some kind of decline in my health and in the way I feel. And I wait, was wait, wait, how old are you now? <laughs> I'm 28 now. We're talking about four years back. I started to feel like every next maybe month, maybe year, I don't feel better than before. So that's when I was starting to think, Okay, well, being really young was fun, so I want to kind of, I want to keep it going. I want uh -huh. to have it again. At the time, I would go to lunch uh, into the Central Park. I was seeing these people on these interesting bicycles, like people just hunched like this. And I was thinking, what is that? I never cycled before. I go and I buy the bike, and a couple of months later, I'm in the cycling team, organic athlete, and absolutely loving it entering the races, doing fairly well, enjoying my training with this new kind of people that I didn't have around me before, the athletic, you know, the healthy people. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking the amount of time I give to the training was not really translating too well into um, the way I feel. I felt a little bit better, but not anything that would really impress me. So then somebody suggested, hey, do some running. I never liked running. Since I was a child, I, I didn't like the idea of just running in circle or just timing and trying to do it as fast as uh, that I didn't like it. Okay. Being in school and in college, you have to run. It's part of the requirement, the courses you have to complete. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that. I wasn't very good at all this time around. I thought, all right, I'll give it a try. If it really will help me cycle better, I'll try to run. And then uh, I enter. I think my first running race was the uh, New York Half Marathon. I enjoyed the race so much that I thought, oh, that actually can be fun. Over time, I noticed my results were getting better and better, and I would feel better and better. And uh, that's something that very quickly made me realize that I do it better than cycling. After a while, I'm not racing bikes anymore. I might start doing again just as a cross training to running uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> next year. But um, what really changed the way I see the running training for me is the trails. My favorite one is Bear Mountain area, mm -hmm. Herman Park. Mm -hmm. That's where I really fell in love with running. But this is time compressed very, very quickly. Yes, here. and all I'm talking about is just like one year and year and a half. That's very compressed. And then, uh, but once I'm, I hit the trails, 
I felt like home. It was just... Were you running with any specific group? It wasn't any specific group, but people who um, ran with me my first these fun training runs that made so big influence on me, they actually all been on the show. It's Todd Jennings. Todd Jennings. It's Michael Oliva and it's Diana Colbert. Uh -huh. They really helped me to see some aspects of running that I didn't know exist before and that I really fell in love with. Excellent. You were starting to feel better. But at some point, your diet changed radically. Actually, it's more than a diet. It's to describe it as a food style or a lifestyle. Exactly. That's something that was also very new to me. I started to question some other aspects of my life. Uh, the time, you know, how much time I sleep, how much time I spent in front of the computer, and most importantly, what I ate. I just ate whatever I liked. Whatever you saw, you ate. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so I was thinking, well, how many calories I can get for the dollar? That's what I'm going to buy. I stumbled upon the website called thefruitarian.com. The, uh, it's Michael Arnstein. I didn't know him before that. Overnight, I was a convert. He was just speaking to me. Everything he said made so perfect sense that I had to give it a try. What would we eat if we were in nature? Because we evolved, the nature created us. So why don't we go back to the creator of our body and, and see what our body was designed for? Mm -hmm. What's the optimal fuel for the body? Mm -hmm. And that idea already made a lot of sense. I thought actually plant-based diet was around way before people started to hunt and way before people started to prepare food in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that also attracted me, the simplicity, Based on just research, it's impossible to make a clear conclusion. It, it really is. You got to try it on yourself. And okay. that's why I decided to run this little experiment, see how it's going to go. I didn't have a period in mind. Okay. I knew that I will try it until I will be con convinced one way or another. Okay. I knew that if I do it so extremely different from what I was doing before, right, right. going only raw fruits and vegetables. This is it. That's it. Just raw fruits and raw vegetables with very minimal mixing up. Just very simple, you know, 10 oranges for breakfast. That's it. Back up because <laughs> it's a startling news. Yes. When you say 10 oranges for breakfast. So let's describe a typical day of eating the 80 10 10 diet, <laughs> which means 80% carbs, 10% protein, 10% fat. Exactly, as a percentage of your calories. Of your calories. Not, not the weight, the calories. The calories. And the calorie, in your case, is about 3,000? At least 3,000 a day. Okay, let's uh, describe the, a, a day of eating in your situation now on 80, 10, 10. My typical day would start with oranges. I really like oranges in the morning. I work in the office. So to make it more socially acceptable, I, what I do is I juice my oranges in the morning and some of them I eat or drink right away and some of them I just put in little sports bottles and I take them with me to the office. Mm -hmm. So I can have, in this way, I can have up to 30 to 40 oranges a day just... Just for breakfast? Just juice. No, 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 no. no. For the breakfast it would be maybe, maybe 10. 10 oranges. Right. And, you would and, juice and, then, and then the rest would be in the bottles say it for the rest of the day, I've stopped allocating specific times for eating. I don't have, you know, breakfast or lunches. I try to eat throughout the day just a little bit at a time. I find it more natural, let me put it this way, and I find it easier to get my calories in this way. And I just enjoy it better this way too. Okay, so, so it, you nosh all day. Pretty much. In my office, I have a big basket and uh, I get out about 12, 30 p.m. every day and see what's good. See what's good, what's ripe at the fruit stand. See a couple of these uh, small uh, grocery stores uh, in Midtown that have some organic choices. they just great. Um, so I just pick what looks good to me this day and okay. then I fill out my basket and everybody in the office is free to grab the fruit. Usually there's more, way more than I can handle in one day so people get if they like it. And I just pick whatever I like throughout the day. One banana, then, then apple, then it could be the peach or nectarine, and that would carry me until, until about 6 p.m. Is the nighttime at the, the meal of the day for you, or is it, or um, is it breakfast? I try not to eat a lot before going to bed, so I definitely uh, have salad almost every day. And normally it's fairly large salad. Um, I eat a lot of tomatoes 
greens are uh, essential for amino acids. I take a great variety of greens. I love spinach, arugula, kale, very different greens. So you mix all that up? Um, actually, most of the time, I just get one thing at a time. So this day would be spinach, um, and then maybe spinach with tomatoes and cucumbers, this kind of salad. And then the next day, it could be arugula with tomatoes as well. Okay. So I but try now, to... Now we're talking a huge bowl, right? We, we're talking some, some large amounts of so salad. So it would uh, <laughs> it would shock probably most Americans to say, going to eat all that? How much time would you allocate? Close to an hour. Now, are, are you drinking organic milk, or is milk as part of the process, or not? No, no, no. No milk? N no animal products of any kind. So okay. just plant-based, raw, plant -based. raw okay. diet. So yes. the part of the diet is 10% fat, 10% uh, sure. protein. Fats and uh, proteins are important. I fully recognize that. And that's where my salads come in. My salads are complete, have complete set of amino acids to build all protein that human needs. Um, even with the ridiculous training and racing that I do. Okay. It's but definitely specifically, enough. do you eat avocados and nuts? For the fats, now I eat very little nuts. I try to uh, stay away from them because the digestion is not that good because I'm already used to sweet, juicy food and the nuts and seeds very, have very different um, consistencies. So okay. the body really doesn't digest them as easily as that's as an orange you're pointing here. Yes, as something uh, okay. sweet so, and juicy. So, what specifically do you eat for fats? Uh, I do eat some avocados. I do like durians. I don't know if you've heard about this fruit. It's called king king of the fruits. Oh, king of the fruits! Yes, really? it's from South Asia. It's really, it's so delicious. It's almost addictive. I'm trying to move a little bit away from avocados towards less fat concentrated food. Okay. But even something like spinach, if you look at the profile, everybody these days can go online and see the profile, the nutritional value of any raw product, of any kind of green or fruit. And you can see that even something like spinach, tomatoes, like normal greens that we don't usually think in terms of fat content, they do have a fair amount of fat. Orange has 4% fat. Okay. Per calorie. Okay. So, but definitely in the transitional period, I ate a lot of avocados. Yes, they, avocados. they give you fats, even more than enough fats. Okay. You don't cook your spinach. No, no. And you eat your carrots raw. I mean, is carrots okay? They are okay. I don't enjoy them. I might eat them maybe once a month if I go out somewhere and okay. that's all they have. I, okay. I might eat some carrots. Yes. Okay. Well, it's good to know. You don't necessarily need to like everything. It's just fine what you like. Yeah, it changes with the seasons. What about protein? I think you have a picture of something that shows uh, <laughs> yes, that's a, protein in action. Yeah, there, there's actually a huge community of people and athletes who eat this way. And we all joke that the most common question that we ever receive whenever we mention this kind of, with this way of living, this way of eating, is where do you get the protein? We developed the best answer to this question is, where do these guys get their protein? It, I'm getting my protein exactly from the same place. They ro those are gorillas, they raw vegans, all they eat is fruit and greens, and look how strong they are. We know they're very powerful the, these creatures. These guys are unbelievable, and somehow they manage to get the protein in. So, so, how, do they, so how do they do that? It's, it's greens. Greens. It, it really is the greens. Well, name, name a Pacific green. Spinach. It has almost all of them right there. Well, Popeye is famous exactly. for uh, maybe eating that, spinach. Maybe this so, is and why. he had big muscles. Maybe this is why. With a small adjustment, you don't have to really can them. You can just eat it the way it is, the way it grows, just raw. Raw spinach. But greens, and, that, and that's a good source of protein. Absolutely, yes. We can see most Americans think of protein going to uh, McDonald's. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> and or that, Burger that, King and, and having it your way. Before we started the show, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the diet must go hand in hand with exercise. This is not a diet in the traditional sense of losing weight, but it's a lifestyle in the sense that it, you also must exercise to take advantage of it. Just feeling so good on this way of eating. And as you mentioned, it is not a diet, it's a lifestyle, meaning that in order to complete your um, natural way of living, there also should be enough exercise, enough sunshine, and enough sleep. Those are essential elements. Um, 
And once I figured this out, I just turned into a completely different person. I felt so great, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to, I had my ambitions just grew tremendously. And I was jealous that these people were, there were some people who able to run something unimaginable, 100 miles running. That was something that it was hard to measure. I remember the times when even the marathon was something so hard to capture in my mind how human can run it. Interesting story about this too. Um, I'm starting to run more. It's about a it couple. Of, uh, it's been a couple of months since I learned about this way of eating, and I started to train a little bit more. But the most I run is half marathon. And one day, Michael Arnstein calls me on the phone and says, "Hey, Dennis, how are you doing today? I, I'm fine. Do you want to run in New York City marathon tomorrow?" <laughs> First of all, I didn't even know it was happening. Second of all, I was thinking. Well, don't you have to qualify for that? I never ran a single marathon in my life. What are you talking about? He said, you, you know what? There is this organization called Achilles International. You probably also know about it. Yeah. And uh, they have a little issue here. Uh, there are a few runners from Russia that came over and they blind. And we need somebody to run with them in the New York City Marathon. Ooh, and I immediately thought of you. And I, I trained with you a couple of times. You'll be fine. <laughs> I was just shocked. And when is it? Tomorrow morning. <laughs> that was my first marathon. And how did you do? Uh, I ran with the runners, so I didn't have my right. own pace. Right, right. I ran with them. And I felt great. And we finished under four hours. Great. I was talking Russian, just practicing your exactly. Russian Exactly. And that's all the help they needed. They, they couldn't speak to anybody before the race. They didn't know where to go. So there was a great help for them. And that was my first marathon. That's how it all happens for oh me. Oh my goodness. And it, that keeps going, is a, it keeps going the same way. That's a great story. And since then, every year I've been doing that. Uh, and actually, I just got the confirmation this year I will do it again. Oh, to run in the New York City Marathon? I, I run the New York City Marathon with, the with, Russian with, with Achilles International. Achilles International. Right. They give me different athletes every time, every year. But And then after I've done it, I was thinking, it's got to be mental. It's all just in the head. Our bodies are, are capable of great things, and we just have to not limit ourselves in, in the mind and try things out and try to get better because we can. I okay. know we can do it. And I knew I can do that. It was just a matter of proper preparation and do it in the, in the matter that wouldn't be, wouldn't be boring. To me, it's very important to really enjoy what I do. And, Having this group of people and the beautiful course that Michael Aliva and Michael Arnstein laid out. For the almost, New York City 100. Almost entirely on trail. Yeah, we started um, in Croton Harmon uh, in Hudson, actually, and we started around 11 p.m. at night. On a Friday or something? Uh, yes, I think it was Friday. So, and we ran through the night to Times Square. It was 40 miles. And then, uh, about 6 or 7 a.m. on Times Square, we meet the group of another 30 people who already knew about this run going on, and they were joining us for different distances. Some people joined us all the way back to the Bear Mountain, which is another 60 miles. And most of this run, amazingly, is on trail. Amazing, you, except, you, except for Times Square. Yes, yes, I yes. guess Times Square, that's where you did your, your bathroom breaks there. We did have some scheduled breaks. Normally, they were just the gas stations. Okay. So we would refuel the backpacks, we would drink, go to the bathroom, and then kept going. And you just enjoyed that experience. But I guess it's part of it was the friendship of the other persons. Absolutely. The other people there. And from there, you went to Vermont, the 100. Right. An official race now. Right. This is this is sanctioned and you've got to pass physical and everything sure. to run this and they test your weight yes. or they measure your weight to make sure that you're safe. Right. And you did this race under 20 hours, I believe? Yes. Great time. Was there any interesting moments doing that race? I learned a lot about my body. I knew, I realized what adjustments I need to make in my training, in which areas I need to improve. Um, it's so complicated racing for so long time, almost you know the entire day and night, that it's not just the running and it's not just the muscles that you need to be worried about. You need to know about nutrition. You need to know how your body will react to the night running. To you know, you need to know how to run on trail at night with a headlamp. There are very many different aspects 
on top of just physical endurance that get in the way on these 100 mile races. So I learned a lot in this experience. And the best part is that I knew that I can improve. I knew <laughs> that some of these aspects I didn't do right and I couldn't improve. That's amazing. You learn by doing in your case. Exactly. And uh, what, did you have crew for that? For that? No, I didn't have a crew. Uh, I teamed up with one of the runners at mile 70. And uh, we ran about the same pace all throughout the race. And then we just decided, well, since we are pacing each other for 70 miles already and approximately doing the same speed, can, we can just run together on the, at night on the trail. So there's a last chance of getting lost, okay. at, at least. Okay, but so yes, you make no friends on these 100 mile runs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's another thing, the social aspect of them. Even uh, the day before, when people all camping out near the starting line and having the dinner together, you get to see some of the people you might know, some amazing athletes, some people doing it the first time, but they all have a very special set of mind. People who challenge themselves to 100 mile race on the trail through the mountain. It takes some courage and, and we have so much appreciation to each other and to people who put together this kind of events and having this huge group together, up to two, three hundred people in the same place, just such a boost mentally. And eight weeks later, you tackled even tougher yes. ultra marathon. You picked this one yourself, or did somebody <laughs> sign you up? You said the other yes. two, somebody dragged you. There is no way I would sign up for something that's much harder than Vermont, because you suffer. And there is no way a anybody who runs these races have to go through some suffering because it's extremely taxing on the body. But somebody said, hey, look at this trail. It's just perfect. You love this kind of trail. And yes, there is some elevation, around 23,000 feet. Oh, God, you know, friends like that, you don't need any enemies. <laughs> They're going to gonna sign you up. Exactly. But you also went in with the attitude of having fun. There was a, a fun aspect to it, if I remember reading. It wasn't just enough to run 100 miles in, in that race. You also had to do that through the ski slopes. That's where all the elevation gain comes in, at 23,000 feet combined elevation. Four times we had to go through the set of the ski slopes, the incredibly steep. Most people had the uh, hiking poles just to get themselves up there. And uh, that's something I wouldn't even think entering. But somebody got me into this race, convinced me, hey, try it. You probably will enjoy it. <laughs> this friend knows me well enough to know what kind of running I do, what kind of trails I oh, like. Okay. And the positive attitude is critical here because it might get so um, hard on you later in the race, mentally. You might think, you might question yourself, why are you doing this? At night, it's cold, you're hungry, you, your legs are hurting and you have another 60 miles to go. <laughs> what are you doing here? Without the positive attitude, without having fun, I don't think it's possible to finish this kind of races. So oh, that's why wow. I only do it when i mentally very comfortable with it. Okay. And I know that I will enjoy at least some part of it. <laughs> okay. Now you told me there was a big storm during the middle of this or during the latter part right. of it. Yes. And somebody, another angel came to help. Tell us about that. So yes, that's in the final uh, 20 miles of the race, I'm, I'm in the lead by about half an hour. Uh, the same friend who convinced me to run it, she was pacing somebody else. And I was set to run alone, uh, but then that other runner, she dropped out. And then my friend Elena, she joined me uh, and she was my pacer. It's uh, 25 miles and she really helped me to protect that lead and mentally it really helps to have somebody next to you running at night when you are already so tired and it's the final miles that you really need to concentrate and keep going. This kind of help is really important. Wow, he's, uh, he's a, really an angel to come yes, through for you. Yes, exactly. And when the storm hit the mountain, as we were there on the last loop uh, through these ski slopes, she just helped me to keep going and say, hey, we're, gonna, we're going to freeze here to death. We need to keep moving. So that was... Oh, that's interesting. So, you, so psychologically, you said, I can't stop or die because it's freezing. You got to keep moving to stay warm. Right, exactly. As soon as you start to slow down, the, the wind and the rain, they were, it was so cold and you're soaking wet and wow. slowing down was not an option. And well, now, 
you said over 50% gave up. So there are probably A stations. We, for example, heaven forbid you were in that situation and in that storm and you yeah. wanted to give up. How do you, how do you give up? It's a good question. And I'm probably not the best person to speak about this because I never DNF'd, as we call it. I Did never finish, drop, yeah. dropped out of the race. But I've heard the way you do it is you have to report to the nearest aid station. And the race was extremely well organized. There were aid stations every at least five miles. Every five miles. So, Great. So you recommend it? Absolutely. Would that, you do it again? I'm already training for it. You're already <laughs> so training? Oh, tra <laughs> next year, I'll be there for sure. So you, you, I guess you're going to go for the uh, record for it, whatever it is. You, but you did a pretty good time. The only uh, person who ran this race faster than me, he did it on a different course. It was slightly different course. Oh, OK. So on the changed course, my time is the fastest for now. OK. So, but I do see some room for improvement, okay. as usual. Well, you're, I will try you're really compressing a lot of life into your young years. <laughs> so in closing, what are some of your future challenges? I really don't like to uh, plan too much ahead, as you noticed. But I will definitely try to um, challenge myself with uh, maybe more competitive field of runners. I will try to get in some of the more um, famous in the ultra running world like races the Leadville like Leadville, like Bad the Western Water? States, maybe um, Hard Rock. You should really be asking your friends what they have in mind for you. <laughs> they, they probably know better. <laughs> they probably know better than me. All, all my achievements, everything I have, I that's there, that's there. Uh, oh, great. Well, in closing, there is, is there any particular person or thing you want to say in closing to your fans? There are so many people. Uh, probably Michael Arnstein. Uh, oh, Michael Arnstein. Didn't he create something special for you for the 100? Do you have that? Yes. Made this for everybody, for every one of us. There are four people who finished it, and he gave every one of us this special award for just completing this fun run, basically. This is a wrap. I think that's the statue at the Van Yes, exactly. Park. That's a copy of the statue at the Van Coulton Park. So that, that, that's still the most special prize I have. OK, Michael Arnstein. He must be a hero of yours. Yes, he's my great inspiration. He basically showed me the way. Listen, this is great. You have a fabulous future. Thanks. And I wish you all the great success in your running endeavors and everything else you do. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much, Will. Thanks.